Sound speeds, and welcome to part four in our three part series on can you EQ a bad mic to sound good? What exactly is part four in a three part series going to entail? Well, I'll tell you, it's going to be a question and answer session because I thought we had exhausted this subject, but apparently there was quite a few questions that were asked in either the comments below my videos or in email. So I figured I'd actually address these on camera since there seemed to be quite a few questions. So let's go ahead and get into it. Nathan Laredo wrote, I had an interesting experience comparing listening to this video on both Sony MDR-V6 headphones versus Mackie HR624 monitors. The headphones made it 100% obvious all the time which one was the cheap mic, no matter what you did to the sound. You're right, Nathan. The way you listen to sound is indeed very important. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of my video, I did say headphones is recommended, and here's why. If I take headphones and I bring that sound very close to my ears, there's very limited opportunities for interfering sounds and distracting sounds to get into my ears. It basically blocks out a lot of them. Now, depending on the kind of headphones you're using, that could also matter as well. Open ear, closed ear, high noise headphones, depending on the brand. Fidelity, for example, if you use something that tweaks a lot of bass in there, you add some bows in there, you add some Beats headphones, that's going to completely affect your listening experience. If they're cheap headphones and they just basically sound really high and tinny, then that's going to affect your listening also. But if you are using monitor speakers, those are farther away and you're at the mercy of your room environment that you're listening in. If you have a lot of hard surfaces, like reflect, like reflective hardwood floors, if you have a TV on the next room, an air conditioner, a refrigerator, if there's traffic outside, an airplane going overhead, someone talking on the phone way back in the background, all those things are going to be distracting to you whether you know it or not. So it's always best when you're trying to do detailed listening to grab a set of headphones and really listen close. LF wrote, I feel like the part recorded with the NW700 is missing some overall resolution and precision. You are exactly right. A cheap microphone is made from a conglomeration of a bunch of different components put together with very little engineering in mind. As a matter of fact, it's more about putting together cheap components to actually make a working microphone than it is fidelity. So the fact that you have a microphone itself that sounds pretty decent is miraculous in itself. So yes, when you say there's something missing, there most certainly is something missing, and it's basically engineering. John writes, am I to conclude that any mic can be made to sound like another by EQing to the spec charts? Say a Rode NT1A sound like a TLM-103? No, 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 no. Rode and Neumann are two totally different companies with two totally different goals in the marketplace. Rode designs microphones that are more entry-level microphones that start in the 200 some odd dollar price point and go up from there. Neumann, you'd be lucky to find a Neumann for much less than about $1,000. And the price difference there is in engineering, it's in quality control, and this kind of thing. It also, believe it or not, there is different costs of production. If two different companies are producing an identical item in two different companies, countries, then it's all about the cost of production, the availability of certain components that go into those. So it may be cheaper for one country to sell that item than another, even though it's the exact same item. Now, Rode and Neumann are not making things the same way. I read an article on Neumann's quality control, and it basically stated that about one out of every five diaphragms produced makes the cut due to quality standards and guidelines, which means that you're basically buying those four diaphragms that did not make the cut, even though you're not getting them. It's quality standards. Now, that's not to say that Rode has lower quality standards if they put out every single diaphragm that they manufacture that's not defective. That just means they have different standards and you're going to pay more for the Neumann for that reason than the Rode. Put it this way, if you're baking a cake or you have two different companies, let's say, making a cake for you and one of them sifts the flour and the other one just throws the flour in there, you're going to pay more for the company that's actually sifting the flour because it's an extra step and takes more time. In part three, you even heard me say that equalizing a microphone is, in my opinion, kind of warping the sound. As a matter of fact, that's pretty accurate in general. When you start EQing a microphone, you're basically distorting the sound a little bit up or down, depending on how you're equalizing it. Now, Neumann and the Rode NT1 have two totally different frequency responses. And if we're just looking at frequency response and not looking at anything else about the microphone itself, it may be one of those things that you say, oh, I can just tweak this here and tweak this there and it's going to be perfect and it's going to sound identical. But that's not actually the case because anyone that tells you that it's only about frequency response and that is so important is not actually understanding a microphone and how it works. 
Microphones themselves are all about the tech itself. It is all about how that microphone listens and how that microphone reproduces sound. You can have two manufacturers making the same microphone that claim they are dead flat and therefore it shouldn't have any coloration, but they do sound very different. And the reason why is because every single microphone that is designed is produced by a different company and those companies do have different quality standards, guidelines, and testing methods. Therefore, it's not as simple as just saying equalize the microphone and it's going to sound the same. The quality of the components is totally different. I'll use that cake, cake analogy again. If I were to make a cake with nothing but the most premium ingredients and they are fine-tuned and they are completely just every bit of flour is sifted every grain of this is cut the exact same way it is measured perfectly the milk is nothing but the most pure organic whatever and then you use nothing but walmart brand everything and you throw it in you're going to see a major difference in quality now don't get me wrong i'm not saying road is walmart and neumann is the premium made cake that's not at all as a matter of fact that's more like this right here this is more the walmart just throwing it all together and don't even bother mixing it or adding things at different times and that's probably more accurate to be completely honest but it, the, the analogy sticks there it hopefully makes sense to you when i put it that way that it's all about how you do it and the way you do it it's not necessarily about the frequency response itself because one microphone could have higher self noise than the other one of them could actually make a different requirement regarding uh thd it could be that it resonates different because it is metal uh, a different type of metal it could be that the pattern is different and it just rejects out more or less depending on how that pattern is it could have more reach or less reach depending on how the how it handles the uh the, the proximity effect when you get closer to a microphone does it have roll off all these things are very important things to, to think about with regards to your microphone it's not just about the frequency response so just saying equalizing it is a very simple way to put it no it's not that simple there's a lot more to it than that TAE Brown writes, but it seems your EQing had the effect of lowering the quality of sound coming from the more expensive microphones rather than significantly raising the quality of the cheapest. In a real world situation, a producer would want to save money with a cheap microphone only if its quality could be EQed in such a way as to compete with the unprocessed sound of the more expensive microphones. Of course, you are correct. In the first video, I used equalization to level the playing field, making all the microphones sound relatively the same, forcing you to have to listen in deeper and that way you could have to listen for all the different components if the microphone still had their special unique characteristics you could have identified it simply based on its sound and that's not exactly fair when you are very familiar with certain microphones and not others so i wanted to level the playing field and remove the special sound from each of the microphones through equalization now you mentioned recording studios you're probably not going to find the newer there even though they could equalize it to technically sound frequency response wise the same as the other Others. But microphones in a recording studio are usually, they vary all over the place. There's not just dynamic and ribbon and and condenser microphones, there's also impact microphones. They're going to have the $3,000, perhaps they'll have the $3,000 Earthworks piano mic system. And they very well could have the C12 Telefunken $8,500 microphone. They also will maybe have the SM7B $400 microphone. It just depends on the studio and their mic locker. But they're, like I said, not going to have the cheap microphones because you're not going to want to rely on equalization to make a microphone sound better than it really is. Because believe it or not, it doesn't. All it does is warp it. And you've heard me say warping because that's the best way I can put it. That's the way it sounds to me is it warps it. Joseph Manouche writes, on the very first pass, I actually got them all right, but digging in and analyzing along the way, I grew convinced of a completely wrong identification. Should have trusted my instincts. Yes, you probably should have. Our brains are very powerful and they have the ability to convince us and pull us in different ways than we really need them to sometimes. Instincts are very strong and for that reason, they're based on survival. And if you are listening to something and saying to yourself, this sounds best to me, or this doesn't sound right to me and then you think about it and say mm, well maybe it's because this actually is the highs and this has the lows and maybe that's not equalization maybe that's it you're over analyzing it and you 
Follow your instincts and you're probably going to end up right in this kind of scenario. DHD writes, I'm glad, sad to say it didn't go over my head. Sad because I'll be unhappy with how something sounds knowing there's better sounding equipment out there. But at the same time, glad because that means I can at least make subjectively better sounding content without relying on having 40 years in mixing. You made an interesting point, and I don't think you even realize how deep of a concept this really is. Let me explain. If you're watching a movie and suddenly you hear a lot of microphone scratch, it takes you out of the experience. You notice something that's not supposed to be there, something that does not match picture, because a wireless scratching microphone sound is definitely something that should not be there, and you are unforgiving to that kind of thing. However, a lesser quality microphone that does not sound necessarily different than it's supposed to sound. It, it's still picking up the sounds that you're expecting to hear, even if it is not the fidelity that you're expecting it to be, your brain still makes sense of it. Therefore, you actually are going to be happier sometimes with lower quality gear, even though you know there's better out there. So the best, most high fidelity equipment out there is ideal, but if you don't have that, you can still get by with good results, knowing that people's brains will make the best of every single situation, provided it's not a technical flaw. Elef writes, smaller electrets are generally much cheaper to implement in a mass production and can even be tuned to work with lower supply voltages like the 2 to 10 volts provided by low-end mainstream devices such as PC sound cards or mobile devices. The audio quality is still great for the price. Even the noise floor is good enough with most preamps. You make a very good point. Most condenser microphones are designed to work with 48 volts of phantom power, some as low as 12 volts of phantom power, or even T-power, depending on the microphone. But this little dude right here can work off of a very, very low amount of voltage. Through this cable, which you look at this and you say, how in the world am I supposed to get phantom power through this? Well, believe it or not, audio jacks on your computers, if it's connected directly up to your motherboard, most likely puts out a little bit of voltage. And that voltage is enough to power a microphone like this. Wire tr wireless transmitters do the exact same thing through the electric power. In the video where I test the battery claims of the wireless transmitters produced by Electrosonics, I go a little bit into electric power and how it basically outputs at 5 volts and up to about 5 milliamps. Now that is enough to power one of these newer microphones. Now believe it or not, the actual diaphragm of a microphone only requires a little bitty bit of voltage, but the rest of the voltage that is supplied by a power like the 48 volt power supply that comes through, that in itself actually has to power the rest of the microphone components itself. So even though there is only a little bit of voltage required to actually make the capsule work, the rest of the microphone requires more to actually operate. Dynamic microphones do not have the same 48 volt phantom supply requirements that a condenser microphone does, but then it also can't match the output gain that a condenser microphone does as well. Now, if I were to guess, I would say that the newer microphone probably splits the difference somewhere between a dynamic and a condenser. The fact that it can run off of about 2 volts of power off of the motherboard through the 3.5 millimeter or 1 8 inch jack on the computer motherboard or rather the output jack of the computer itself tells me that the microphone itself is required it uses less power, and if it uses less power, then the output gain is not going to be as high. Now, what I would be interested to find out, and perhaps you can help me test this, is if I plug into my computer with this cable, is the output gain the same as it would be if I connected it up to a 48 volt phantom supply? As for this microphone sounding great for the price, yeah, I guess you could say so, because it's $17, yet you get a large diaphragm condenser microphone with XLR, a shock mount, and a cable. Now, considering that this is entry-level, 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 you have to keep in mind that chances are the quality that you're outputting it, I don't mean that the content that you're putting out is garbage. What I mean is that you don't necessarily need to record at 44.1K or 48K when you output on your podcast. Chances are, if you go anything below about 32,000, that's when you're going to get all the frequencies of this microphone. Anything higher than that is can output it. It can't actually output higher than 16,000 kilohertz anyway. It doesn't actually have the technical specs to go higher than that. So if you're even outputting your your podcast at maybe eight 
5K, then chances are it's going to be full. You know, it's going to sound like a phone conversation. And if that's the case, then this microphone should do fine for that. Even if you went out at 16K, it's still going to sound like a high quality VoIP call. So yeah, this microphone will do just fine in those circumstances. Brian Morris Gill writes, most people with such an inexpensive mic also have a low end interface. What interface and preamp did you use for the test? A sound device is mixed pre six, not exactly what you would call cheap. So I see your point. He continues, I also have to point out that any file in the real world would have been equalized to negative three dB for use. It would have been helpful to hear your final file equalized to that standard level. Let me also add that in a later message, he did clarify that he meant to actually say normalized to negative three dB, not equalized to negative three dB. Point made. I'll see what I can do if I revisit this topic in the future. DHD writes, doesn't this sort of negate the whole experiment? I mean, you're not comparing the mic to the more expensive ones as they're supposed to sound. Well, I do see your point on that. As I mentioned before, I kind of wanted to level the playing field and make all the mics kind of sound the same. That way you had to listen deeper. But maybe I do need to revisit this and try to make a cheaper microphone sound as good as the rest. Curtis Zenner writes, I would like to hear the good mics EQ'd normally. Make them sound the way the mic was made and the bad mic EQ'd as best you can to see if it can come close to matching a good mic in overall sound quality. Yet again, another good point. So I think I may end up having to revisit this again. We'll see. He continues, the reason I'd like to hear the comparison is because I have the exact newer mic you use in the videos. I use them for podcasting. I use a Rode NTG2 for voiceover, but two newer mics for podcasting. I would love to buy better mics for podcasting, but it's not in the budget. If there is a way to make them better, then I'm all in. But if they will never measure up to a more expensive mic, then I might start saving money to buy better mics. You probably will want to save up for better mics. As a matter of fact, I'd recommend it because as good as these are for the money, they are not going to match the fidelity and quality that a better microphone would have. I would say maybe aim for a used market two to three hundred dollar price range microphone. You'd probably find them in the one hundred dollar price range. As a matter of fact, I got the microphone I use on this channel, the CAD E100 vintage model for about one hundred and fifty dollars on eBay. And I think it works pretty well. And considering that you and others want me to continue testing, I'm announcing a part five. That's right. I'm going to revisit this microphone test and I'm going to do it a different way this time. I'm going to equalize the newer microphone as well as I possibly can. And I'm going to equalize the other three as well as I possibly can as well. And it probably won't take much as a matter of fact, because they are pretty good quality microphones. I'll do four more tests and I will see what you think. And if you're able to blindly pick out which one is which. Oh, and Brian Moore skill, you'll be happy to note that for this upcoming test, I'm not going to be using my sound devices mix pre six for the test. I'll be using a Tascam DR40, about $170 recorder. That's something to look forward to in the next video. Click here, by the way. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Sound Speeds and be sure to tune into the next one where we do more microphone testing and offering sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.